Welcome to As a Woman, Fertility Hormones and Beyond. I'm your host, Dr. Natalie Crawford, and I am a board-certified OBGYN and fertility physician and also co-founder of Fora Fertility in Austin, Texas. Each week on this podcast, I discuss health and fertility and how they relate to your true self. Become a part of the community of collaboration that amplifies others as a woman. I hope you enjoy the episode. Hello and welcome back to the As A Woman podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Natalie Crawford. I am a board certified OBGYN and REI. I'm a fertility doctor and this podcast exists so that I can help you learn about your body, your fertility, how to advocate for yourself, and really the basics that we should have learned a long time ago. Thank you so much for being here. Share the podcast follow along, subscribe. Those things matter. Downloads matter. I know it's crazy, but you guys have been so supportive of me and I'm just so grateful. A few things today, we're going to dive into a question. And one of the things that has really blown me away has been the fact that this podcast has been used to educate other providers. I love it. So OBGYNs and family doctors, people in internal medicine, it's even been implemented into medical school curriculums. So mind blowing, but really just shows the importance of accessible education and explaining concepts in a way that you can understand and you can then explain them to other people. So today we're going to answer a question actually from a colleague who sent in a question request, which is a common clinical scenario that I'm excited to dive into. So if you have your own questions, feel free to call and leave a voicemail. 657 229-3672, 229-3672, and leave a question. You can also leave questions on Instagram on Mondays at Natalie Crawford MD. These questions will be answered on Instagram or redirected to content or answered in the weekly newsletter. So that newsletter, you can sign up for it, nataliecrawfordmd.com slash newsletter. We have really exciting things coming as the book is getting closer and closer to launch, but we also have the TTC starter guide, which is just one document packed full of some of my favorite tips and tricks if you're trying to get pregnant and also favorite recipes get put in there. Update is not spam. I promise. All right, we're going to dive into this week's episode and here we go. Hi, Dr. Crawford. I'm an OBGYN in my first year of practice. I love your podcast and I recommend it to a lot of my patients. I've had a few patients this year for what I presume to be unexplained infertility. Their workup seems negative. They seem to ovulate regularly. I'll check their AMH and it will be in the like 8 to 10 range. I generally steer them to REI, but they're often hesitant due to cost and want to try ovulation induction. I often don't feel comfortable giving them if the AMH is above 10, but should I be? What is the risk of overstimulation in these patients? I'm often spooked by a high AMH in PCOS patients because they can have even higher numbers, but is the risk of overstimulation the same in them? Thank you so much. All right, we're going to dive into a few of the words and definitions about what we're talking about, and I promise we'll get to the meat of the answer. First of all, I really commend any of my colleagues who are trying to balance that delicate walk of helping their patients manage infertility in their office, but also recommending an evaluation. This is a very common story where I hear from colleagues all the time that patients do not want to go to REI because they're fearful of the cost, yet sometimes that puts the OBGYN in a bad position. Number one, you should never feel pressured to do treatment that you don't feel comfortable with, and that's okay. That's why there are extra fellowships. People will have an easier time saying, I'm not going to manage that cancer. I'm not going to do that extremely complex surgery. I'm not going to deal with that prolapse. I'm not going to deal with that high risk pregnancy complication. Infertility is the same. And it's important as a consumer, as a patient to know that not every doctor will practice the same way. People will do nothing. They'll send their patients right to me and I will do the entire workup counseling, the whole thing. On the other end, I will have colleagues who want to do the entire workup. They like to do low risk treatment or lesser aggressive treatment options, and then only send them to me if it's for IVF or egg freezing. Both are fine, but you should never pressure your doctor to do one or the other. And part of it is this fear of an increased cost by going somewhere that doesn't always exist. So the fertility evaluation usually consists of a semen analysis, 
a test to see if your fallopian tubes are open and your uterus is normal, blood work, and an ultrasound. This is often covered by health insurance if you have it, even if you don't have full fertility coverage. If you've been around on the podcast for a while, you've heard me say that you can't make decisions on data you don't know. And I mean that very sincerely because it's easy if you have tunnel vision to say, please just give me some Clomid. But I see patients who did that, who tried that for a year and then found out their tubes were blocked, partner had no sperm, they were running out of eggs and they could have been more aggressive during that time. It's one thing to have all of that data and then make your choice. It's another to feel like some treatment is better than nothing because that is not always true. Personally, I don't even like doing ovulation induction alone, meaning you do not ovulate, we know it's a problem, without doing the complete workup. Because again, you're paying for treatment, you're spending your most valuable commodity, your time doing that treatment. And what if there's also another factor? Infertility is not always just one single diagnosis. I think it's reasonable in those circumstances, which is not what this question is about. But in those circumstances, if you do not have a regular period and it has been evaluated, your thyroid, your prolactin, your follicle count, your uterus, and we feel comfortable knowing why you have an irregular cycle, if your doctor wants to do ovulation induction, as long as there's some way to monitor response, and ultimately you're young, because if you're older, your time is more precious, simple as can be. But you are proceeding and spending your commodities without really having the full picture. So that is never my preference. If you come into my office and you have PCOS, you're gonna hear me say the same thing every time. We're gonna do a full workup. Yes, this is a problem that could be corrected, but we don't know what else exists and we need the full picture before we proceed. Unexplained infertility by definition means that you have regular periods. You have regular periods. You have normal anatomy. So you've had an HSG test or some other test to show the inside of the uterus and the fallopian tubes are open. And you've had a semen analysis to show that your partner does not have lack of sperm. So you've ruled out male factor, uterine factor, tubal factor, and ovulatory factor. What is left in unexplained infertility? Well, it's unexplained. So I always think these are fertilization issues, environmental issues, the environment being your body. A lot of this could be autoimmune, inflammatory, endometriosis. You could have egg or sperm quality issues. Some of this could in theory be timing if you're not timing things right. And I always say that unexplained is really just undiagnosed because it's harder. These are harder things to diagnose. These things do not have an easy blood test. These things do not have an easy way to know exactly what's going on. Take endometriosis, for example. For endometriosis, you have to have a surgery to fully formally diagnose endometriosis. So it's very different than a semen analysis or a blood test. Having a low AMH, the opposite of this question scenario or diminished ovarian reserve is not a cause for infertility. That doesn't fall into one of these big diagnostic categories, but it is a big red flag and a warning sign that something else is going on. I always say, but why? Why do you have a low AMH? What is causing that? And that might be something that also is causing infertility and could help explain pieces of the puzzle. Unexplained infertility by definition, people have a regular cycle. So adding in ovulation induction agents like letrozole or Clomid, those things do not change all the things I listed off conceptually as what's wrong with unexplained infertility. It's not helping egg or sperm quality. It is not helping get egg and sperm closer together. It's not helping change the environment or lower inflammation. It's not doing any of these things. So why do we think in somebody who's already ovulating that making them ovulate more than one egg is really changing the picture? Because that is what happens when you add ovulation induction medications to somebody who's already ovulating. 
So if we look at what's happening, I always like to think about having all your eggs stored inside that vault in your ovary. Every month you have a group of eggs that comes out of the vault. Each egg grows inside a follicle. From the brain, follicle stimulating hormone is sent out, FSH, and its job is to stimulate one follicle to grow. As that follicle grows, the egg matures, eventually makes enough estrogen to signal to the brain to send out LH and then ovulate. After that, the follicle reforms, makes progesterone and pulses from LH pulses from the brain. Eventually that corpus luteum dies, you will have a drop in your progesterone levels and you'll get a period. And then the process will start over again. So the driver of egg growth is FSH from the brain. Clomid. Clomid is what's called a CIRM, a selective estrogen receptor modulator. So this binds to estrogen receptors, making it so that the brain thinks that there's no estrogen. So if that receptor is blocked, the brain thinks there's no estrogen even when there is, it then sends out a stronger signal of FSH going, oh my gosh, we need to grow an egg. And people who do not ovulate because they have PCOS, for example, and some of their natural estrogen is too high, either because of the high number of follicles they have or sometimes because of extra fat cells, which is a problem due to the insulin resistance and the androgens of PCOS, fat cells make estrogen too. And this is like static interference to the brain. So the brain has a harder time sensing those changes in estrogen and is restricted from sending out enough FSH. Well, suddenly you take Clomid, oh my gosh, there's no estrogen, boom, you're gonna send out a big signal of FSH. So Clomid is one of the medications that can help people who do not ovulate, ovulate. Letrozole is the other one, and this is called an aromatase inhibitor. Essentially, what it does is lowers circulating estrogen levels. So same problem exists, you have naturally a higher estrogen because of PCOS, this is going to lower it. It's not totally blocking it, but lowering it. The brain senses the decline and sends out some FSH. One of the hard things with both of these medications is it requires the brain to interpret what is happening. So if you have any form of hypothalamic amenorrhea, or thyroid or prolactin issues, any type of stress interference, then this is not a reliable pathway because the brain has to sense that change in estrogen and send out FSH. The other thing is that you don't control how much FSH is sent out. There's this idea because there's different doses, that that's equal to different doses of FSH, but it's not. It's almost like a threshold dose. At what dose does somebody's brain sense the estrogen change enough to then respond? And the higher your AMH is, one, the higher the risk for over-response, so not just ovulating one or two, but ovulating a lot of eggs, leading the risk for high order multiples, or it actually can put you at risk for not responding at all. So in fact, an AMH level of greater than seven in somebody who doesn't ovulate regularly, that's a high predictive sign that they're not gonna respond to oral ovulation induction agents and might be better served to go on to injectable hormones or IVF or more aggressive treatment faster. But if you have unexplained infertility and you're already ovulating, why would we give somebody Clomid or Letrozole? Where the goal here is really what we call super ovulation. We are now trying to get somebody to ovulate more than one egg. With the idea, if I can have more eggs, potentially that can help. But very interesting, it is only helpful in studies for unexplained infertility when we combine it with an IUI or an intrauterine insemination. So if we look at somebody who has unexplained infertility, you've had testing, it's all normal. Your baseline rate of conceiving after one year without having conception is going to be dropped to about four to five percent per month. So maybe you were 30 and your age-related rate was closer to 20 percent per month, but now you're a year down the road, your testing is normal, and you're living at now a four to five percent chance. One, that's not zero. That number is not zero. That means that you absolutely could get pregnant naturally. Expectant management is an option. Now, is that efficient? No. Is that probable? Also no. But you're not in the position where we know you are, quote unquote, infertile, not able to conceive. You just have reduced fertility compared to your age, but all your testing is normal. You have unexplained infertility. If you've now been trying two years, Let's say you are afraid the fertility doctor is too expensive. 
So you're going to hold out and just keep trying. After two years of trying with regular cycles and normal sperm and open tubes, your chance of getting pregnant is now 2 to 3%, even if you're young. That's also not zero, so again, it doesn't mean it can't happen, but it is just such an inefficient way to grow your family, and if you want more than one kid, it really doesn't always make sense. Adding ovulation induction on to these treatment cycles boosts your chance of conceiving by about 1%. Because the problem isn't the egg per se. Having an additional egg is not changing things. It's grown in the same environment. You have the same tubes. The quality is similar to its next door egg neighbor that just grew. The sperm is the same. So we're really not modifying any of those factors. Therefore, that's such a negligible change. It's not a significant change. So ovulation induction for somebody with regular cycles who has unexplained infertility is not helpful. I understand if you're a patient and you just want to do something and get it, but doing treatment and paying for it that has no change in your outcomes is really not a good use of your time. And it does have potential risks. So risks of overstimulation, risks of high order multiples. Although when you go through infertility, you often think if I could have twins, I could catch up. We know that having twins means you have a lower chance of bringing a baby home. But those risks are so much greater for triplets and quads, and we really don't want to be in a position for those outcomes. Also, the stress of going to the office, having ultrasounds or blood work, taking medication. If anybody's ever taken Clomid, it's not that fun. When your body senses you have no estrogen, the response is not pleasant. It shoots out that FSH because, OMG, your body wants estrogen. Hot flashes, headache you can feel really extreme mood changes. Now, if you respond and grow a follicle, make estrogen, you'll feel fine after, but that can be really unpleasant. Letrozole does have fewer side effects, and ultimately, if you have PCOS, it is the medication of choice to help you ovulate. But if you have unexplained infertility, neither of these medications alone with timed intercourse is recommended. Meaning, if you're going to do any treatment, Doing super ovulation, purposely getting somebody to ovulate two or three eggs, plus putting the sperm closer. My favorite analogy is to think about a football field. So if you have unexplained infertility, you are trying to throw a touchdown pass from the zero yard line all the way to the other end zone. Like, could it happen? Sure. Is it likely? No. Four to five percent chance. You got one receiver way down there. You're all the way across the field. In super ovulation plus IUI, well, now I have two or three receivers wide open in my end zone and I've moved my quarterback. I've moved all my players to the 50 yard line. I'm a lot closer. So I'm at least improving the odds that eggs and sperm can come together. And this is a significant difference. It doubles it from your four to 5% chance to an eight to 10% chance. That's a significant change. And that can be worth doing, but it's important to think about it in the big picture because if your players all have broken legs or broken arms, they're still not going to be able to make the shot or they're still not going to be able to win the game. So there are some aspects of egg and sperm quality that none of this is changing. I'm not putting the better players further down the field. I'm not having the better receivers in the end zone. We're just trying to up the odds that that can happen. 8 to 10% per month means 9 out of 10 people who do that cycle for unexplained infertility will not be pregnant. Okay, 9 out of 10, not pregnant. When put that way, a lot of patients say, geez, that, that doesn't sound very good. It's not zero. It's higher than just having intercourse. But again, should you just keep doing Clomid with timed intercourse for a 5% chance or just have unprotected sex for a four to five percent chance. To me, there's no utility in pain for that ovulation induction treatment alone, and the risk outweighs the benefit. If you don't want to go to aggressive treatment, super ovulation plus IUI is a great option. Many OBGYN offices do not do this, not all, but you do need ultrasound. This is a treatment cycle where you need an ultrasound, you need to know how many follicles you have. You need to be able to have a way to time when the insemination is going to happen, whether it's LH testing or a trigger shot, and you have to have a way to process the sperm. 
if you're not pregnant after three, the odds that you get pregnant go down. So when we look at cumulative success rates, it's about 30%. Almost all of this is happening the first three months. Small second group in the next three months. Do not do this longer than six months at the very maximum. Depending on family goals age, most clinics will kind of stop after three cycles because it doesn't financially, ethically time make sense. But fertility is a personal journey, so it might make sense for you. So the patient who says, I'm never going to do IVF because X, Y, Z reason, then this is all I can offer them for their unexplained. We might do up to six IUIs, but you're delaying getting yourself to that point by doing Clomid or pressuring your OB to do Clomid when you're already ovulating. So I think that this is an idea when you have something you know is wrong, like infertility, you know, something's wrong. You're not getting pregnant. Even an unexplained infertility, you know something's wrong. There's this idea, I just want to do something about it. I get it. But number one, you should have the full workup. You deserve that. Number two, your fertility doctors are very nice. I promise we're nice. It's often not going to cost you more. The time and the cost of going into your OB for a treatment that's so unlikely to work is frustrating. And very often patients sit in my office after trying that Clomid with timed intercourse for six to 12 months after they'd already been trying for a year. And when they hear how low those odds of success are and that it's essentially not any different than just having sex, that's really frustrating. And so as an OB who might be thinking, well, this is a treatment my practice often does or I'm new in practice and this is what my partners do or the patients are pressuring me and where's the line between being a good doctor and letting the patient have some autonomy in their situation. For me, this is where you should tap out. If you know statistically you're not helping them, you're just imposing risk. And especially if you're not set up for mid-cycle ultrasounds to monitor them, the big question, why? How are you helping? Or are you just facilitating a pathway to let the patient potentially make a decision that's not right for them because of this idea of perceived cost or perceived difficulty with the fertility clinic? You should say, hey, you have unexplained infertility. That's a really tough diagnosis to get, and I'm so sorry. Because of that, the best treatment options are either keep having sex, understanding your chance of success is 4 to 5% per month, Go see the fertility doctor. They can talk about super ovulation plus IUI or IVF. There's no treatment that we can do here in the clinic that can help you. The exception here would be if your clinic can do super ovulation, mid-cycle monitoring, and IUI, then you could offer that there in your clinic, only if you feel comfortable with it. A lot of times, we have a lot more time with patients. Our new patient consults are 60 minutes. There's a lot of education. We dive into a lot of these topics. We really talk about statistics and percentages a whole heck of a lot. There's no right or wrong choice for anybody, but everybody knows age is the number one predictor of success. Time is your most valuable commodity. And you deserve to not waste your time doing treatment that's not gonna change your chance of working. On the other hand, if your periods are irregular, you do not need to try for six months or a year before you go see an OB or a fertility doctor. If your periods are not regular and predictable, which means they come within the same couple day interval every month, whether that's 24 to 26 days or 28 to 30 days or 32 to 34 days, if your periods are coming at a regular interval, great. If they're hopping around, even if they're in a quote unquote normal range, meaning 24 days one month, 32 days one month, 25 days one month, 29, 35. That's what I call irregularly regular. It comes every month, but at these really different intervals. If your cycles are really long, really more than 35 days consistently, that is a sign of ovulatory dysfunction also. If your luteal phase is short, If you know you're ovulating and that luteal phase is not at least 12 days, day you ovulate till the day you start that next period, or you have spotting in the luteal phase, those are also signs that can be the first stage of ovulatory dysfunction. 
those are not unexplained infertility because you've got some ovulatory issues. So that's a circumstance where you might say, okay, well, due to your luteal phase that's short, we're going to try a couple months of low-dose Clomid. My clinic doesn't have the ability to monitor you, and I want to make sure that you don't have any risks of over-responding, so we're just going to do this very low dose. That's all I feel comfortable with. If your AMH is higher, for people who have an AMH 4 and over, I exclusively use letrozole. So we know for those patients, because they have a high AMH that's coming from a high follicle count, they therefore have a high baseline estrogen, that letrozole's mechanism of action is going to be associated with a higher live birth rate. Without monitoring, I wouldn't want to go over the lowest dose in somebody like that. But ultimately, if you are the doctor in this scenario, you need to feel comfortable and set your boundaries. And I know that takes time in medicine, but that's okay. It's not a shortcoming to say, I am not the best one to take care of you because you have unexplained infertility. I would like you to go see my colleague. You're doing the right thing because you're putting them in the position of power to have all the data they need sooner and to get real information to make choices for now and for their future family. If you are in the patient spot, I talk all the time about advocacy. Advocacy is different. Can you explain why you don't think Clomid would be helpful for me? And your doctor says, unexplained, no change. I don't have the ability to do the higher level treatment. Okay, that makes sense. Advocating for yourself is not saying, I want you to do Clomid or you're a bad doctor. There's a difference. Advocating is knowing questions to ask, being in an environment that you feel safe to ask them, and being respected enough to get answers back. It's okay that your doctor doesn't do everything. That's why they're specialties. You shouldn't demand a treatment, one, because you never want somebody doing something that they're not comfortable with. That's never going to be the best scenario. Asking or asking for an explanation. I have patients who do this all the time hey, would I be a candidate for X? Could you explain why or why not? You didn't mention Z to me. I presume that's because you don't think it'll work, but could you tell me why? Or I've always been curious about this. Here's my symptoms. Could we evaluate that? Medicine is tough on both ends. Having a patient-physician relationship you trust is really important. And I think that sometimes in this scenario, there is this misunderstanding from both sides. So I would say for those high AMH patients, I wouldn't want to do any ovulation induction, any super ovulation without ultrasound monitoring for sure, because you do have a higher risk of overstimulating. And I'm not worried about hyperstimulation syndrome, but I'm worried about those high order multiples. It's not wrong to say you'll be better taken care of in a different place. If patients are afraid of money, you can say often it actually doesn't cost more and doing treatment that's not going to improve your success rate, that does cost money. What I find is that there's a big difference in just saying, no, that won't work. No, we can't do that versus taking two minutes to explain to somebody, this is what unexplained is. This is your chance with no treatment. This is why this treatment's not going to work for you. These are things that we could potentially do, but those are done from a fertility clinic. Patients are really smart. They can accept things if you package it the right way. So I think think about your clinic and your setup, what you feel comfortable managing, whether that's ovulation induction, if you like doing the full of workup or you like sending patients on, and it's okay to say, this is what I feel comfortable doing, or this is when you'll be better served somewhere else. And remember, Outside of ovulation issues, ovulation induction like Clomid or Letrozole with timed intercourse does not have a place. If you have unexplained infertility, Clomid and Letrozole only improve your success rates when they are paired with an IUI or an intrauterine insemination. All right, friends, well, I hope this helped you have a little bit of some understanding in when we use Clomid Letrozole for what scenarios and why an ovulation or not regularly ovulating is different than unexplained infertility. As always, love your questions, so call and leave more of them. You can call the voicemail 
at 657-229-3672. Again, that is 657-229-3672. You can leave your questions Monday on Instagram at Natalie Crawford MD. Some of our regular episodes, non-Q&A based, we will answer some of those and sign up for the newsletter at nataliecrawfordmd.com slash newsletter. Thank you, friends. Thank you all for listening to As A Woman. It would mean so much if you could rate, review, and follow the podcast to be notified of new episodes every Sunday. I hope you learned something new, and I hope you share it with someone in your life. Be sure to follow along on Instagram at Natalie Crawford MD, and check out the YouTube channel, Natalie Crawford MD. If you're interested in becoming a patient, you can also follow Fora Fertility. I'm so thrilled to have you here, part of the community that amplifies others as a woman.